Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, please note that uh, live captioning is available as well as ASL translation, and that we're recording today's session will be posted uh, later today. And today we'll be able to go to about 2 p.m. and fit in some questions. Uh, please note that we're working hard to be ready to share information about the winter semester, uh, including the results of our uh, various surveys, our faculty survey and our student survey, uh, late this coming week. Uh, I'd like to introduce today's participants. Of course, as always, uh, we're joined by Provost Collins, Vice President for Student Life uh, Harmon, Chief Health Officer, Dr. Preeti Malani, and each of them will give brief updates. Uh, we're also joined today by Dean Michael Barr of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and Michael will be discussing engagement opportunities around the election. Uh, Laura Blake Jones is with us, uh, Dean for Students, and we'll, she'll be discussing high-risk prevention uh, efforts around Halloween and around this weekend's MSU football game. Uh, Nicole Banks is here and she'll discuss um, uh, fraternity and sorority life. Uh, we've gathered some questions that came in from the community during the week and we'll answer some of those, as well as some that come in today during the discussion. So thanks again for joining us and let's get started. I'll hand things off to Dr. Milani for an update on campus conditions. Thank you. So it's hard to believe, but we're done with nine weeks of the planned 12 week in residence semester. I feel like I count down the weeks, uh, not, in a, not in a bad way, but because I think this is very challenging and things are certainly not normal and they haven't been perfectly smooth, but I'm happy to be able to report some good news today. Uh, during the last town hall, that was about 10 days ago, we had the announcement of the stay at home order for undergraduates on the Ann Arbor campus. And since then, our daily case numbers have decreased nicely, which was the goal, uh, but there still are cases. And as noted previously, when case investigation is done, the common thread is social gatherings and especially indoors. And that's something we're seeing more and more as the weather is colder. Also a lack of physical distancing and a lack of masks. Uh, you'll recall that the public health capacity is really what drove a lot of the stay at home order. Uh, that too is better. The uh, quarantine isolation housing is now only about a third full. And if you recall 10 days ago, it was two thirds full with the concern that it was gonna fill up completely. The uh, EHS team is working hard and they're catching up on contact tracing and case investigation. And those turnaround times are also better. And although case counts on campus are lower, we certainly cannot take a victory lap as the numbers around us are surging in Michigan and really all over the country as everyone is aware our state test positivity rate is now above 5%, and this, that's something that we haven't seen in, in uh, many months. Uh, that number is, is even higher in surrounding Midwestern states. I looked this morning, it's about five and a half in Ohio, and it's above 20 in Wisconsin. Um, when I'm not thinking about COVID on campus, I'm an infectious disease doctor at the university, at the health system, and I am taking care of patients. And you know, I'm just thinking back to the spring and the conversations we had that I never wanna have again. And unfortunately, we're having to think about those things. And people around the country are having to have these difficult conversations. I, I know everyone knows the importance of this um, and also the difficulty of staying vigilant. But you know, as humans, we want to be together, but we have to limit gatherings, especially indoors. Uh, the life that you save might be your own and might be that of someone you love. So small groups spread out, be outside whenever possible, and wear your face covering. On testing, we always like to talk about testing at this town hall. Testing capacity is good, uh, certainly to support symptomatic testing, which is being done uh, at UHS. And uh, that is that along with post-exposure testing. We're also uh, beginning to think about departure testing. And I'll address that in a few minutes here. Uh, that is students leaving for the semester. The uh, community sampling and tracking program is up and going and working very well. They're, um, they're about 800 tests or so a day and increasing. The goal is to have everyone in university housing tested a couple times between now and November 20th. Of course, if assuming people are here on campus, uh, th this is more convenient. There are four locations now. And what the team has been doing is trying to come to the residence halls. For example, everyone who lives in Bursley will get an email saying, hey, today we're at Bursley, come down and get tested. Uh, there is a request to please re register ahead of time and you think about if you go to your doctor, you don't just show up for a test. You need to, to register so that people can make a label and things. 
So it's not to create barriers or to discourage testing, but just for logistics sake. The uh, departure testing info is on the website. And basically all students are advised to practice enhanced social distancing and be tested before they leave campus in order to reduce the likelihood that they're gonna go back to their permanent residence, their home communities and infect anyone with COVID. And so this will be 14 days of enhanced social distancing prior to travel, getting a COVID test seven days prior to departure. And this will be a saliva testing through again, the community sampling tracking program. I'll note that this is required for students in housing and it's encouraged for other students. Uh, there'll also be a recommendation to quarantine for 14 days after arriving at your permanent residence. And this is, this is a lot. Uh, this is based on a, a very conservative set of guidance from the public health team as well as the university. And again, we're trying to provide advice on what is the safest way to reintegrate with your, with your home community and your families. Uh, there's also some recommendations on safe travel. Speaking of departures, I have gotten some emails this week from parents asking whether they should bring their students home. And you know, I'll just say, I think this is an individual decision. Uh, the things that I would consider is one is, is your student happy? Are they productive here? Uh, are they having a good experience or are they anxious about getting COVID? Are they not able to get their work done? Are they feeling lonely because they're in their room by themselves? How far is home? Is home set up to study and learn? And, and again, I think that what I would like parents to remember too is that a lot of students are, they're in the thick of the semester. They're writing papers, they're doing midterms and the idea of packing up and leaving is also stressful. Um, I would not base the decision on the dashboard and whether or not an individual residence hall has cases. Th those numbers lag and the risk is not simply living in a particular hall. It's really about what you're doing socially. It's about what your roommate might be doing socially. Uh, even if cases haven't have increased now, that risk is not really that different day to day. It's been there all semester long. I know other speakers will address this, but I did want to highlight some of the great work being done by our students. I, you know, I just, I like to push back on this narrative that the young adults are here having parties every day and, and not following the guidance. And, you know, frankly, that's just not true. The majority are simply trying to keep their education on track and getting through the semester, but they're also tutoring school children who are home with virtual school, they're getting out the vote, they're building the next solar car, and they're trying very hard to move on their, with their lives in a way that promotes health and safety. And I think this middle ground is where we all need to try to live for the foreseeable future. You know, some need to be at home, some are on the front line and they're gonna be out in, in the thick of it, but most of us, we're just trying to reframe what we do. I also wanna acknowledge again, that some of us are having a hard time with the disruption uh, so parents, students, remember there's no wrong doors. We're here to help CAPS, Dean of Students, Wolverine Wellness. But for now, it's the same message, you know, wear, wear your face coverings, watch your distance, wash your hands, monitor your health. Most importantly, keep your social gathering small. Only by doing these things can we remain here together safely. And, you know, for this matter, it's not just our campus community, it's really keeping our state safe and functional. I think that's clearly where we would all like to be. So let's keep working together to keep everyone safe and healthy. Thank you, Dr. Milani. Provost Collins. Great, uh, thank you, President Sussel. It's uh, good to be here at another uh, Friday briefing. I wanted to start by just seconding um, what uh, was just said about the great work that so many of our students are doing across campus in all of the schools and colleges, and uh, we're really proud of you. So uh, it's great to, to learn about many of those things. I'm gonna spend most of my time in the update today talking about guidance related to our expenditure policies and financial resources for academic units, but just have a few other items that I wanted to touch on first. So um, we will announce as, uh, as you've heard our plans for the winter 2021 semester by the end of next week. And we're working to balance a, a wide range of different considerations, including health and safety, as well as our academic mission. Um, I'd also like to thank the many faculty and students who completed surveys last week. The information we gathered will be very helpful. And it'll also be important for us to continue gathering feedback from staff who fill so many varied roles on campus. Um, as a first step, we did reach out to student affairs staff in schools and colleges, to staff in central student life offices and school and college budget administrators, as well as human resource officers. And again, we'll be expanding that uh, outreach. 
We're reviewing all of that input. And of course, we'll share the, the results publicly. Um, President Schlissel and I also met with the Faculty COVID-19 Council this week. This was the first of what will be bi-monthly meetings throughout the academic year. And we wanna thank SACUA for their hard work in selecting 16 very thoughtful members of the committee. They represent a variety of schools, colleges, different tracks and disciplinary areas across campus. The council will engage with the administration on a wide range of uh, issues, including health, safety, and well-being of the campus community, the pandemic's impact on teaching, learning, and the lives, personal and professional, of our faculty members, and issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including accessibility, uh, and how the pandemic intersects with other issues that affect our campus. Um, I'd also like to cycle back to an important question that was asked two weeks ago about what students should do if there are technical issues that arise when they're trying to uh, access or submit an exam. And so we've developed some explicit guidance that we've shared out with all of the deans to push out to faculty and also to share with students. And the information is up on our website. So in particular, we continue to encourage faculty to think of alternative forms of assessment rather than uh, timed online exams. But we do recognize that some instructors really do need to administer digital assessments using a secured system. So for those, we now have suggested syllabus language for faculty. And um, the idea is putting that language not only on syllabi, but on all of the assessment uh, sign-in messages and having information about exactly what to do if there is a technical glitch. Um, so in particular, emergency contacts on every exam document on the Canvas site, and then blocking the time that the exam is actually being given so that the instructor is available if, if issues arise. If there's a problem, students, of course, can also contact ITS for help directly as well. You know, I just like to stress exams are typically a stressful context for the people who are taking them. And it's even more so in the current conditions. And so providing kind of extra reminders and making ease of access when there are questions for contact information is really particularly important at the current time uh, as students are uh, focusing on their, their work in, in difficult times. Uh, and that will help to reduce stress to some degree and really enable students to help to do their best work. And so welcome the partnership of faculty and instructors across campus uh, as we think about exams and testing. So turning now to the budget, as I stated in my recent update, we're on target to meet the revenue projections that were approved in the fiscal 20 year budget and also relieved that we don't need to impose additional budget reductions. The pandemic does continue and we have to be cautious and recognize that there's still a number of uncertainties, um, but we're, you know, we need to be focused on our mission and, uh, and how we deliver that. So that does mean continuing the cost containment measures, but we have to recognize that there's some things that you can pause for a month or two that really start to become mission critical if you pause them uh, for, uh, longer, for longer than that. So we've issued some updated guidance to the deans of the schools and colleges. It doesn't remove the spending restrictions, but it does loosen them a bit. And the idea is to, to balance kind of prudent spending with the commitment to long-term excellence in our teaching and research. And um, we've also asked our deans and directors to work with their teams to make sure that there are no unnecessary barriers that are getting in the way of spending um, uh, that, that really aren't needed. So in particular, working with UMOR, we've updated the guidance to allow for an expansion in the ability of faculty members to use institutional funds to support research and scholarship. And that relaxation is uh, important in terms of addressing some of the inequities that have been in, induced and exacerbated by COVID-19 across the research enterprise, uh, especially by those who depend on internal funding. So faculty can use institutional funds to advance research and scholarship without seeking an individual exception, such as their startup and uh, discretionary research funds, internal grants, of course, consistent with unit policy. Examples of some of the research activity that faculty cannot yet use those funds for would be travel to conferences, hosting, uh, in-person events, uh, things like that. So if there are questions, please contact the research associate deans or your unit leadership for um, you know, uh, answering more detail. Um, we're also providing guidance to allow that uh, deans 
there's other essential expenditures, things like replacing failing computers. That's one that we've heard a lot as people are, you know, working uh, on, on their computers much more intensively. And so that replacement of failing equipment for faculty and staff as well. And the idea is to try to simplify some of the decision making going forward as, as we kind of balance that context. So a gradual limited relaxation of the spending restrictions. We can't return yet to just business as usual, um, but uh, you know, working together to, to move with a, a sustainable approach that uh, kind of enables us to move our, our mission forward. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the question answer session. Thanks, Susan. Vice President Harmon. Thank you, President Slisso, and happy Friday, everyone. Uh, as we get later in the semester, I wanna to touch on a, an, an important recurring topic and that's health and wellness for our students. So students, I know that you're feeling stressed. Many of you are feeling stressed and tired and we're all looking forward to the break in a few weeks. Um, you've completed nine weeks of one of the most challenging semesters ever. And I know that you're all doing your best. So I, I, I wanna compliment you for that. I see you, I hear you. And we're taking your well-being very seriously. And we have resources and opportunities for you to take care of yourselves and stay well. Um, so if you would go to wellbeing.studentlife.umich.edu. Again, that's wellbeing.studentlife.umich.edu. You can uh, participate in some of those resources and, and programs that are provided to support you. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the stay in place order in a reference to uh, this weekend with Halloween and the game. In particular, we've been hearing from students and their families that they wanna know what we're doing to keep them safe during the stay in place order since we have Halloween and a big football game coming up this weekend. And Dean Laura Blake Jones will talk much more about this in a few minutes, but I just wanna mention a, a few important comments. For example, our team in student life will be increasing our safety patrols and intensifying our response to high risk social gatherings uh, that will result in violations in the residence halls. Um, these violations may result in parent family notifications or potentially housing contract terminations and other disciplinary measures. For off campus conduct, students hosting high risk social gatherings may face suspension or other disciplinary measures. All of our heightened accountability measures are consistent with the addendum to the statement of student rights and responsibilities that was approved last fall as a part of the Wolverine culture of care. And I know, again, I wanna emphasize what Dr. Milani said that many of you are doing a great job and we appreciate you following the rules to keep the campus safe. A common question though that is often asked is how do we enforce the uh, culture of care? How do we um, make sure that people are doing the right things. We function on referrals, which means we're counting on every member of the community to hold each other accountable. That's the magic here. We have to hold ourselves accountable and hold each other accountable. Each case is refer that is referred to us is handled within 48 hours. Students receive educational resources and a follow-up from the Dean of Students Office, as well as Fraternity Sorority Life as applicable. And for most students and student groups, that is more than enough. All of this probably feels uncomfortable, um, but you came here as leaders to join a university with a rich heritage, heritage of activism and doing the right thing. What is right is not always easy or popular, but we need you to stay committed to that. And again, you can stay safe and follow the stay in place order and still have fun this weekend. That is possible. A variety of activities that you can find at events.umich.edu include an international Halloween party, a murder mystery game through the Center for Campus Involvement, screening of Knives Out, and I haven't seen that, I need to see that, and a drop-in drop two-person long games hosted by Rec Sports at Mitchell and L. Bell Fields. Just a, a couple more quick points. I wanna talk a little bit about the election and Dean Barr will speak uh, much more about that. But we know the election is coming and we wanna provide you with some brief information about voting and pre-election and post-election engagement. So including today, there are five days left before the, the election. So I'm gonna offer five action steps that I would encourage you to do between now and Tuesday, November 3rd. One, make sure you, say, you have a say in your future, so vote. Two, encourage three friends to cast a vote 
uh, with you to cast their ballot. Two, a uh, three, uh, consider signing up to work the polls. In fact, if you're on campus, our campus polls still need more volunteers. So visit the signature initiative section at speakactvote.umich.edu to sign up. Four, you can also find out about events and support resources that connect that you can connect to after the election by going to the speakactvote.umich uh, website. .edu, sorry. And number five, continue to use your voice and power to make our community a great place for everyone. Check out ways to engage through the Ginsburg Center and make sure you vote. I say that again. And finally, as Provost Collins mentioned, we'll be working diligently to develop the, the process for planning and decision-making around winter semester. And we'll have specifics for you later in the week. And I wanna thank the many members of our community that have done the right thing this entire semester. When the going gets tough, you got tough. So you are the reason why we call our students leaders and best. I'll close with go blue and beat MSU. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martino. It's your first Michigan MSU football weekend, a little bit different. I know how excited you are. I'll try to restrain yourself a bit. Uh, I uh, also encourage our students, you know, we've worked hard for almost two weeks now uh, during the stay home period uh, to really knock down the incidence of spread of COVID-19. And I think we have made progress. Uh, I don't, wouldn't, it would be sad if that progress was reversed uh, because of Halloween or because of uh, the MSU game. Uh, the MSU game is on Fox, regular Fox. You can watch it on TV. You can stream it. Uh, enjoy the game. Enjoy the game with your roommate. But please, be, please be careful and don't give up the progress that we've made. Uh, I want to briefly reiterate resources that we've posted online for staff. You know, staff uh, often don't get as much attention in these sessions as they should. But the HR website uh, has a page on working through COVID for fall 2020. A uh, bunch of resources are listed there. And we did solicit uh, staff thinking uh, about what next semester should look like through focus groups and through voices of the staff as well. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. Now, the only other thing I'll say is we continuously are trying to improve our COVID-19 dashboard and make more data, clearer data available to the community. Uh, this week, uh, we actually added the results from 7,000 tests done between March and mid-October. Uh, when multiple tests over time were done on the same person, each one of those is an independent test, and that's the way the field does things. So we added a bunch of tests to give us more accurate information. Uh, we've also decreased the number of duplicates in our data set. So it's uh, continuously improving. We're getting the data from multiple places. Uh, 47 cases that we reported uh, before were duplicates from various sources. So those were taken, uh, taken care of. Uh, and we continue to endeavor to improve our uh, presentation data so we could all as a community uh, see how we're doing and try to continuously do better. Uh, so I'll now introduce our weekly featured segment on voting and the election. Uh, and once again, turn things over uh, to Dean Michael Barr. Thanks very much, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me for this um, special appearance to talk about the election and democracy. The most important thing I'm gonna to say today uh, is to go out and vote. Uh, as you've heard, the university has teamed up with the Ann Arbor City Clerk to open a satellite office in the UM Museum of Art, UMA. Uh, the project was launched and designed by professors Hannes Matrich and Stephanie Rowden. You can register to vote, pick up your ballot, fill it out and drop it off all right there, including on election day. There's also a drop box on North Campus. And of course, you can go to the downtown city clerk's office too. On election day, you can go to regular polling places all over campus. As you've heard, the county's public health stay in place order that applies to U of M undergraduates does not restrict voting or any election related activities by students. So please vote and help others exercise their right to vote too. It's important, of course, to acknowledge that elections can be very stressful times. We're in the midst of a fiercely contested presidential election and one that stands out in part because some are questioning the democratic process itself. Combine that with the pandemic and stress levels are really up. It's a hard time for our country and for so many of us here at Michigan. And we encourage, as you've heard, members of our university community to seek out help as needed whether that's campus resources such as CAPS or the Wolverine Support Network, or a Zoom call with a loved one, or a walk or run outdoors. 
Some are worried more broadly about safety with the election. The university, the Division of Public Safety and Security, Student Life, the Ginsburg Center, Center and many others have been coordinating on public safety with local, state and federal officials. There are daily meetings, incident response teams and emergency communication protocols. The university will continue to communicate with the whole campus about staying safe. We encourage you to vote and to participate beyond voting in the many opportunities to engage in the democratic process and to learn about the issues. The team organizing our democracy and debate theme semester has compiled an impressive list of opportunities and events. We had a great conversation, uh, for example, between our students and the incomparable Trevor Noah of The Daily Show. We had a bipartisan conversation with the secretaries of state of Michigan and Ohio. Students have submitted lyrics for their own Star Spangled Banner to be performed by a Broadway star. Faculty have developed democracy cafes with accessible content our students can use to learn more about issues relevant to the election and our democracy. Visit speakactvote.umich.edu for complete details. Here are some upcoming highlights of activities, events, and resources. On activities, you can submit your suggestion for the Democracy and Debate Social Justice Playlist to be released on Spotify. I've suggested Billy Holiday, Strange Fruit, Bruce Springsteen, Nebraska, Billy Bragg, Which Side Are You On, The Velvet Underground, Sweet Jane, and Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. What are your picks? Please let us know and, and join the Spotify playlist. November 1st is your last chance to share your thoughts for the future president for the I Wish to Say project, where you can dictate uh, a postcard to the next president. And November 2nd is the Dance for Democracy from nine to midnight. It's a virtual and safe Wolverine dance party with renowned bands, U of M students and surprise cameos I urge you to vote either before or after the dance and to please join us. We have a great number of events coming up. I'll just mention two. One is this afternoon, starting right at three o'clock. We have an event at the Ford School discussing policing, reform or revolution. It should be a really exciting, interesting and challenging conversation. Wednesday after the election on November 4th, we have an evening discussion, election 2020 in context, community conversation. What if results are challenged? The role of the courts in presidential elections with U of M law faculty, Sam Bagenstos and Ellen Katz. There's a whole bunch of resources um, available to you for self-paced learning on issues around the election. Student uh, support services and faculty and staff uh, support resources all on the speakactvote.umich.edu website under the learning opportunities tab and I urge you to check out those resources and use them. Remember to read your election 2020 in context newsletter that's been arriving in your inbox each Sunday evening for me and Cynthia Wilbanks. All the activities around the democracy and debate theme semester have been the result of extraordinary cross-campus collaboration. I'd like to thank all the uh, members of the core team for their amazing work in bringing this together. Thanks to Professor Angela Dillard, Chair of the Theme Semester Academic Advisory Committee for her work on coordinating academic activities on campus. To Mary Jo Callen for the extensive collaboration with the Ginsburg Center. And to Catherine Carver and Ann Zalucki, who are the co-leaders of the core team and have organized all this amazing work across campus. Let me leave you with a final word on the election. And I think this is really important. On election night, or the day after, or even for some time after that, it's likely that we won't know the outcome. And that's okay. It's to be expected with such high voter turnout and absentee ballots. High voter turnout, by the way, is a good thing. We'll probably need to be patient. There's a well-defined process in each state for completing the vote count and reporting official results. For example, in Michigan, absentee ballots can't begin to be counted until election day. The Michigan Secretary of State has indicated that vote counting will require several additional days of work. Even so, with these processes in place, there may continue to be litigation or other contention about voting processes. It's important to make sure that every vote is counted. It's important that we let the process play out and that we stand up together for the integrity of our democracy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dean Barr. 
Uh, next is uh, Dean Laura Blake Jones. You're on, Laura. Thank you, President Schlissel. Sorry for that difficulty there. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back here with you all again and happy Halloween. Since the last time I was with you a couple weeks ago, we've certainly been faced with more challenges on campus with our continuing cases and helping our students navigate through the stay in place order. This weekend, as we've discussed, we face Halloween with a full moon uh, that actually last happened in 1944. And back then it wasn't a blue moon, nor were we playing Michigan State at home during a pandemic. I wanna emphasize that most of our students, as you've heard today, continue to do all of the right things and taking care of themselves and taking care of maize and blue. COVID-19 fatigue is real. And most of our students have been doing their best to stay home, keep their distance and mask up. They've been working hard at their studies, resisting the natural inclination of college students to gather and socialize in large groups, and have been mindful of the impact their individual behavior can have on the well being of others. For the students listening to this update and the student leaders working to keep our community safe, I want to thank you again for your commitment to living the Wolverine culture of care. Last weekend, it was great to be able to watch our Wolverines take the field and take on Minnesota. It was absolutely an amazing game, and not just because we brought home the little brown jug. It was also great to be able to watch a familiar scene, even if only on TV, and to participate in something that felt normal and familiar to so many of us, cheering on our fellow Wolverines. This weekend, we have the opportunity to play our in-state rival, Michigan State, at home in the big house. And while none of us except the players and their families will be in or near the stadium, there will again be the comfort and the familiar as we watch from home as the players run out of the tunnel and take our home field. I hope our students will be watching with their roommates, cheering with their masks on and savoring every moment. COVID-19 has taught us that we can't take things like this for granted, that we need to savor all of the normal moments that we get in 2020 and realize how precious they are. The next game and other familiar things we hope to take for granted again soon are not guaranteed these days. With cases rising in Ann Arbor and across the country, we can't afford to be fatigued about COVID-19. We have to remain diligent and keep masking up Michigan and reminding our friends over this weekend when they'd rather not wear theirs, how important it is that they do. Experts tell us we can still flatten the curve of the second wave right now and save many lives if we just do simple things and continue to set aside what we wish we could get back a little to doing for a little while longer. Those who stay will be champions has been the mantra at Michigan dating back to when coach Bo Schembechler was new to Michigan and some of his players were initially resisting the work ethic he required for success. He reminded them then of the need to persevere and keep working in unison for a common goal. We used an adaptation of that slogan this week to remind our students how they need to stay the course, preserving and continuing to commit to keep our, I'm sorry, persevering and continuing to commit to keep our community safe. The video featured President Schlissel sharing that those who stay home will be champions, Executive Director Washington reminding that those who stay safe will be champions, Vice President Harmon and I demonstrating that those who stay socially distanced will be champions, and Athletic Director Manuel indicating that those who expect respect on and off the field will be champions. As far as our enforcement plans for the weekend goes, we're starting from the strong foundation we've built through the Wolverine Culture of Care. We've saturated the campus with messages this week, reminding our students how important it is that they stay home to watch the game double screening with a game on the TV and using another device um, so they can hail from home. Their friends from MSU or elsewhere who wanna come visit them in Ann Arbor this weekend, unfortunately just cannot do that this year. We know that's disappointing, but hope we can embrace it for now so we can get back to being able to do the familiar things we long for again in the future. 
We've also been reminding students at, on and off campus who've already been warned about gathering in too large of groups that they can't repeat those behaviors this weekend. If they do, there will be significant consequences for them and for our community. We've appealed to the business community who also have a role to play with ensuring bars and restaurants follow public health guidelines and occupancy limits. Our student life staff will be out and about on campus and in near campus areas tonight and all day tomorrow, alongside our colleagues from the Washtenaw County Public Health Department, UMPD and AAPD, demonstrating how we need to work together to keep our community safe. To protect our community, we will be strictly enforcing the stay in place order so that we can stem the tide of rising cases. Quite simply, we all have to step up and be leaders at our best this weekend. I think Coach Harbaugh summed it up really well in another video he prepared for our students this week. He shared in the disappointment of the students that they won't be able to be in the big house when the team takes the field on Saturday, reminding them instead to stay, stay safe and watch the game at home with their roommates and concluded by encouraging everyone to stay positive and test negative. We know as the weather has turned colder that our students are feeling more isolated. It's important that we bear Coach Harbaugh's words in mind and direct students to the many virtual activities they can engage and remind anyone who's struggling or just needs some extra support of the resources that are here for them. Besides the football game this weekend, there's also a number of virtual activities planned for Halloween. And I think you should check out the School of Music, Theater and Dance's virtual Halloween concerts that'll be offered at 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. on Saturday. And certainly don't forget all of the th events chronicled at Happenings at Michigan. Finally, I encourage you to explore the tips and resources to help you stay safe and healthy that you see on this slide right now and connect to the Maze and Blueprint website um, for more information. Finally, as Dean Barr mentioned earlier, this is obviously also election week during a tumultuous time for our country. The range of events that are planned as part of the democracy and debate theme semester leading up to elections on Tuesday present an extraordinary range of educational opportunities for our students. The events, activities and information to inform the voting process should not be missed. Following the elections, there will also be sessions offered to make meaning of the results, provide opportunities for students to gather virtually and understand the outcomes. And of course, as everyone has said, don't forget to make your plan and vote. For parents and families on the call today, I hope to see many of you next weekend during our virtual parents and family weekend. It will be great to connect with you and share more information then. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Associate Dean of Students and Interim Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life, Nicole Banks, who will share some of the proactive work that we've been doing with fraternities and sororities and specific information about how you can report any behavioral concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Since the beginning of the pandemic, a number of local residents and student families have asked for more information about the fraternity and sorority life program on campus. As we have all seen, a number of campuses across the country are really focused on how large and close-knit student organizations like these can adhere to the public health guidelines and what additional support they may need. So I'd like to take a little time today just to share a little bit about the fraternity and sorority community at the University of Michigan, chapter facilities, or we refer to them as chapter houses often, and student accountability. There are currently 51 affiliated social fraternity and sorority chapters, which consist of nearly 5,000 University of Michigan students and make up our four council FSL community. At the University of Michigan, we have the Inner Fraternity Council, or the IFC, the Multicultural Greek Council, or the MGC, the National Panhellenic Council, or NPHC, and the Panhellenic Association, Association, which we refer to as Panhell. Many people may not realize that the majority of Greek letter organizations around our campus are not affiliated with FSL. The list of currently recognized chapters can be found on the Fraternity and Sorority Live website, fslumich.edu, under the Community tab. Roughly 30 chapters from IFC and Panhell operate chapter houses in this area, which accommodate about a third of the FSL population. 
and the facility facilities are located in nearby off-campus neighborhoods. Chapter facilities are privately owned and managed by the organization headquarters or alumni house corporations. The sorority facilities have full-time live-in staff. And like most U of M students, the vast majority of FSL students live in apartments and houses that they lease with groups of their friends. At the University of Michigan, we have a supported self-governance model for recognized student organizations, which means that student leaders guide their communities and the members have a voice in their community's rules and group accountability. FSL staff meet regularly with chapter and council leaders, alumni volunteers, and international headquarters representatives. Our staff supports the leadership, development, and productivity of chapters through the council structures, and we investigate any concerns reported that relate to student health and safety and chapter operations, including membership and practices like eligibility and or concerns about hazing. When policy violations occur, FSL will submit a formal complaint to the Center for Campus Involvement, which oversees accountability and recognition for student organizations. And complaints pertaining to individual policy violations are reported to the Office for Student Conflict Resolution. The leaders from our four affiliated councils have worked very closely with a number of student life, law enforcement, and City of Ann Arbor officials throughout the year for planning and for responding to issues that arise. This year, the council presidents and their respective executive boards have been especially thoughtful and committed to the safety of the campus. In light of the stay in place order, last week, Fraternity and Sorority Life sent messages to every affiliated student, encouraging them to continue their efforts to be active bystanders and asking them to report any violations of the order or the ongoing public health directives. Finally, this slide, has information about the See Something, Say Something initiative from Fraternity and Sorority Life. Before I close, I want to invite you all to report any stay in place violations. Concerns about fraternities and sororities can be reported directly to FSL. And given the size and complexity of the community, please be sure to include the names, locations, and other details of violations you observe. If you see something, say something. Thank you for this opportunity. Let's stay safe and go blue. Thank you very Thank much, you very Nicole. Much. Uh, now bring back Dr. Milani and our guest panelists today. Uh, Preeti? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna pose a question to our three guests. And I, I know each of you sort of touched on these broad issues, but I just, I wanna ask a question very specifically, like what message would you like students to know going into this pivotal time for our campus and for our nation as a whole. Maybe start with Michael. Um, thanks, Preeti. You know, I'd start with the basic message of uh, voting and staying engaged in our democratic process. I think it's the right thing to do. Our country needs you to do it. And it will also, uh, I think, help uh, keep you sane in this uh, very difficult moment. Um, it's important to, to have a chance to work on things um, outside of our own uh, little world. And so voting, supporting others in voting and exercising their vote, staying engaged in the democratic process, learning about the issues, uh, I think it'd be a wonderful thing to do right now. It's a great message. And I, you know, this morning I just got an email from the health system with uh, medical students who are helping patients with voting, you know, some of whom didn't expect to be there. So that, you know, in terms of like just giving everyone the right to exercise their, their right to vote. Uh, Nicole, same question. What message would you share with our students? I would encourage students to really think a lot about the importance of, of the social connection and ensuring the safety and welfare of the larger campus community and the state and the region. So thinking very carefully about the decisions they make for um, how they operate throughout each day. And, and what connection that has to others around them. That would be my message. Thank you, that's a, a great message. And Laura, what would, you, what would your message be? I would tell our students that they really need to be there for each other right now. Um, the isolation and loneliness is real. 
um, and uh, we can really uh, seek out the opportunity to connect to each other virtually um, and even uh, as you're interacting, uh, send encouraging messages to others. And finally, um, really listening as we're uh, contemplating so many things right now, really listening for understanding and wanting to know more before you make up your mind. That's so, it. Great, great messages for all of us. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about, um, and these, these are some of the questions that have come in. Uh, Provost Collins, I'm wondering if you can talk, students have asked a lot of questions about grading. Sure, um, and, and actually this is a topic that when I met earlier this week with the central student government that they raised as well. And I know that there are student concerns um, that we're hearing from across campus. So, you know, as people know, we did implement a modified grading scheme at the beginning of the semester, um, trying to address the, the concerns and the unusual aspects that we were anticipating. And it's gonna be important for us to take a careful look at what the learning context and learning environment has in fact been. And so we haven't made any specific uh, decisions about making a change, but we are looking carefully at the current learning environment and um, it will, we'll have more to say about that. Great, thank you. And this, uh, this question I'm gonna to pose to uh, Vice President Harmon. Uh, there have been uh, several questions about housing refunds, and can you share the latest information for our students who live on campus? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Milani. So uh, we offered the opportunity for, as you spoke actually in the beginning, for any students that felt like they wanted to leave during the stay-at-home order, um, that we would be able to uh, refund the remaining portion of their housing and dining. And it, essentially what students need to do is to follow the checkout protocols, which include testing and just the general housing checkout protocols. And that needs to be, that process needs to start um, uh, before the stay in place order ends. So once they start that process, essentially um, they will be, they will receive a refund or a credit to their account, which will be approximately $35 for the days remaining. That may differ based on the type of room that they have and of course the number of days um, that are remaining based on when they leave. So I would encourage students who uh, should have received uh, that information directly, but please contact housing for more details or if you have questions about that and how that process works. And I wanna emphasize there was no public health reason why we we're telling everyone to leave, but we know some students you know, at this point just felt like it was a good uh, idea for them to depart and we wanted to make sure that we facilitated that if necessary. Thank you. Great. There's a, a question here. Um, have we been able to tell if the stay at home order for undergrads has helped slow the spread on campus? I'm gonna see if uh, President Schlissel wants to comment on that. I think it is tough to tell in honesty, Preeti. It, it seems to have slowed some this week, but you can tell those of us that keep the reporting uh, dashboard screen up on our computers all day long and stare at the thing as I do. Uh, um, the data is slow to come in because uh, testing, it takes a while for a person to decide to get tested and the testing result comes back either in a day or if you get tested uh, off campus, uh, it takes several days to come back. Uh, so the trend is in a good direction, but the data is not complete yet. Uh, but we have experience with this. We did this back in the springtime when the governor ordered a statewide stay at home order, uh, and it had a remarkable effect slowing down the pandemic. So the extent to which our student community can comply, uh, I think it's very, very likely that things will come under better control. And you can see also the um, um, pressure on our quarantine and isolation facilities is diminishing because as students finish their either 10 day or 14 day periods up there, uh, and head back to their regular locations, um, uh, they're not being replaced as quickly with new students uh, that are being asked to quarantine. Uh, so the census is going down. So that's a good sign. Uh, and the, the case investigation backlog, as you mentioned earlier, is being worked through. So those are all good signs, good early indicators. Yeah, and, and I know people do look at the dashboard regularly and it, it, it fluctuates a bit. And again, not because someone is trying to hide numbers or, or switch things around, but because the data are, are actually imperfect when they come in and, and as we get better information, that gets corrected. And so someone had asked in one of the questions, you know, well, if cases are going down, why did they go up double one day to the next? 
that might actually not be a true doubling in that day. It might've been from a few days ago. So I wanna come back to an important issue and this, I'm gonna start with Nicole on this, but related to safety, can we talk a little bit, you touched on this a bit, but the planning that has gone into this important weekend. With fraternity and sorority life in particular, um, ongoing meetings really have um, picked up in number and conversation topics have really focused on how to ensure that students understand that the stay in place order really is going to um, supersede any other expectations of the annual rivalry or um, social gatherings with alumni or friends or family. Uh, we worked closely with Michigan State University's fraternity and sorority life program and developed joint messaging that we sent to students who are affiliated on either campus, um, making sure that they understood the landscape in Ann Arbor um, and the importance of adhering to that so that we can continue to um, try to slow the spread of the virus and, and, and keep our community safe. And also encouraging Michigan State students to understand what the, the risk could be for them in terms of transmission of the virus and, and any increase um, experience back in, um, in, in East Lansing. And so trying to prevent that has been at the forefront of our, of our thoughts. We've talked not only with our students and with our counterparts at Michigan State, we've also been sending messaging and holding meetings with chapter advisors um, and keeping the national headquarters informed as well. So the expectations have been very clear. Our student leaders, whether they're leaders of chapters or of councils, have been really focused on working with one another um, to create an understanding of how to have social events, if you will, from your own residence hall. I think we've been talking about hailing from home. Um, some of them caught on to a term, a, a, a statement of just saying, because it's spooky out there. Um, and we just appreciate their creativity um, and flexibility. And we hope that um, our first year students in the organizations can understand that this just has to be a year that is different and they can look forward to the future. Thanks, Nicole. I think for all of us, it's really been a year of reframing social interactions and actually thinking about what you can do instead of all the things you can't. And um, I think you, you touched base mostly around um, FSL, Fraternity Sorority Life. And I don't know if Martino, Mark, Laura, if you have other comments, just on, in general, the planning around safety. I think people don't always know all the proactive stuff that is happening in this space. I, I would mention, not to repeat anything from earlier, but Vice President Cynthia Wilbanks has convened a, a really a cross campus committee <laughs> of individuals in various areas to coordinate athletics, um, safety and security, student life, many other departments to really make sure that we're all on the same page, we're planning, and then we're connecting those plans to the county and the city um, as well. And there's a city and government, state government uh, and university group that also meets and talks about safety planning and issues. So it, it goes beyond any one particular unit. It's a really cross campus initiative. You know, another advantage we have in terms of preparedness, as everybody recalls, we were scheduled to host this major debate uh, um, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, would have uh, been canceled, actually. It was the second <laughs> of the three debates, so I caught a break there. Uh, but uh, a lot of advanced work we did uh, around campus safety and security in the context of the election uh, continued, uh, was stimulated by uh, when uh, we were preparing for the host of the debate, but continued afterwards. And I know there are many people who are concerned about depending upon the outcome of the election and Michigan being a swing state, how safe am I going to be in my hometown here in Ann Arbor or in Ipsy or in any of the surrounding areas? Uh, so there've been a lot of work done on ways to, uh, 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 for various um, uh, uh, public safety entities to collaborate, to try to keep people as safe as possible, uh, regardless of the outcome and regardless of how long it takes the outcome to be clear. So. Uh, please get a little solace from the fact it's been worked on pretty intensively for a while now. Thank you. I, I'm going to uh, ask another question, and Mark, you might want to weigh in on this. Will students be accommodated if they test positive just before the November 20th end of in-person semester, or will they be made to quarantine in their permanent residence? Uh, we'll take care of students who test positive uh, before leaving during this in-person part of the semester, and they'll be able to stay on if they wish. Uh, there's always the option to complete your quarantine or isolation period at home at your permanent place of living or even your temporary place of living if the health department investigators uh, uh, think that you can do so safely. So if you have 
uh, your own bedroom, if you have access to a, a, a bathroom and can effectively isolate and quarantine, it's okay to do that at home depending upon uh, how you get home. So going on an airplane is not a good idea, but if you live in the region, they could work out ways to help you quarantine at home. So if a person can't or, uh, go home or feels uncomfortable going home, of course, we'll take care of you through a quarantine period. Thank you. And there are more details on the website under, under travel guidance. And I'm gonna, uh, maybe this will be the last question. I'll ask uh, Provost Collins to weigh in. What are the lessons learned from having a hybrid semester during this fluid COVID-19 environment? How can these lessons be applied to the winter term to instill student faculty and staff confidence and ensure a more successful and complete semester? That's a great question. It's also a really huge question. So um, let me just say a couple of, of things about that. And, and certainly so much of the work that we're doing related to planning for next semester is exactly focusing on what have we learned and how can we use those lessons to um, improve the experience. So th there's some things we've learned that have gone really well. Um, one thing that I'd mention there is all of the work that happened uh, during the summer to redesign some of our classroom spaces on campus so that the in-person instruction that uh, um, has happened and the, um, that that has been able to, to go safely. Um, we've also learned that um, the different contexts across our schools and colleges are really quite different, both in terms of what types of things are really best delivered in person in terms of instruction and places where we, we can really do a, a, a very robust, um, engaged uh, approach with um, remote and online learning. We've learned that teaching hybrid where you have some students physically in the classroom and some who are on Zoom is really hard. It's challenging, it's stressful, and it's really difficult. And so for those faculty who do choose to do that type of approach modality, um, to, to think about ways to support and, um, and help them. And then more generally, this has been really stressful for our faculty, for our students, for our staff. We really need to work together to find ways to improve the experience. And, and that's something that is gonna be kind of a huge part of our collaborative work going forward. I'll stop there, a great question and a lot of pieces to that one. Well, you know, thank you very much to everyone. The last thing I'll say uh, has to do with something of great concern to me, but a, a enormous concern to many members of our community and that's the Ann Arbor Public Schools. Uh, so I had a, a phone conversation with the superintendent, Jimmy Swift, last week, uh, and we promised to work together to look for ways that uh, if there are things that we do that impact the schools, we want them to be positive impacts on the schools. Uh, and we wanna do whatever we can to help them safely uh, bring uh, school children back for in-person education uh, for the sake of these uh, students and their educations and for the sake of the families of these students. Uh, who need uh, help so they can do their own work uh, as well. Uh, so there's an ongoing dialogue and we're committed to it. And I'll report back as we learn things that we might be able to do cooperatively or collaboratively together. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy and have a safe Halloween. Enjoy the MSU game. Uh, I predict good things this year. I'm, I'm an optimist. I think the momentum is in our favor and uh, take solace, as someone said earlier, from the regular normal things we can still do. So let's watch a football game. Let's watch it safely. Uh, let's cheer the team on. Have a good weekend. Remember to vote and go blue.